Hey guys, it's finally time for part 5 of this video series, the top 5 martial arts movie stars of the 1990s who weren't Jean-Claude Van Damme or Steven Seagal. So number 1 on this list is a man who I feel could have been bigger than Jean-Claude Van Damme and Steven Seagal if it weren't for his untimely death. Yes, if you haven't guessed it by now, of course I'm talking about Brandon Lee, son of legendary martial arts sensation Bruce Lee. This video took a while, I did a lot of research, it kind of really beat me up, so I hope you enjoy it. Bruce Lee is of course a man you all know of, in fact he's a man the entire world knows of. Bruce Lee is as synonymous with martial arts as Arnold Schwarzenegger is with bodybuilding. You could say these two men found and achieved their purpose, and with that inspired millions across the world to seek out and better themselves in some way. These two men are prime examples of what an individual is capable of achieving in this world. As far as Brandon Lee goes, it's not this lineage to Bruce Lee that would have made him a huge star. Sure, the name may have initially opened the door to help him get started, but none of that door opening would actually lead anywhere meaningful unless Brandon Lee had something that audiences wanted to see. The so-called it factor. I think he showed hints of this in Showdown in Little Tokyo with Dolph Lundgren, and even more so in Rapid Fire. There's a certain charisma Brandon Lee had that transferred over very well to film, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this video. But first, let's talk about the martial arts. <laughs> Study. Since I was four, you should have started earlier. That would have helped you four. I was four! Unlike Brandon Lee's character in Showdown in Little Tokyo, he actually started even earlier than that. I started training with my dad really as soon as I could walk. I mean, my dad was a really diligent trainer and he always had people over at the house practicing, uh, friends and students, and that was just how we played at my house, you know? Uh, in fact, I remember when I was a little kid, a lot of my friends didn't want to come over to the house because there were always these men out in the backyard screaming and breaking things, you know? My mom gave me some videotapes, you know, some old black and white Super 8 things transferred to video of me when I'm just a tiny little kid working out with my dad, so it was a good time. Sadly, he would lose his dad at the age of eight, and with it, the world would lose a martial arts icon. Bruce Lee died at the young age of 32 on July 20th, 1973. Make sure to stay until the end of the video, by the way, because there's a very important message I want to share with you that may prove to be eye-opening and beneficial for a lot of you. After his father passed, Brandon Lee would start stunning under Dan Inosanto, a friend and disciple of Bruce Lee. Brandon Lee said, It's always been a part of the daily routine. After my father passed away, I began working out with a man who was a senior student. In his mid-teens, Brandon Lee stopped training in the martial arts and instead preferred soccer. Although Brandon Lee took a hiatus with his martial arts training, he would still be well versed in the arts due to his 3-4 years of training in Cali, the national martial art of the Philippines. And by 1986, he resumed his studies and started training in Yi Chan Tao, a relaxation based martial art with trainer Mike Vindrill. Brandon Lee said that the exercises helped him become less tense while punching a bag, and that the training consisted of exercises such as slow sparring and wooden dummy training. He would eventually return to his main craft of Jeet Kune Do with Inosanto as his main trainer. By his mid-twenties, Brandon Lee was seen practicing regularly at the Inosanto Martial Arts Academy and in 1991 received a certification by the Thai Boxing Association. When asked about which martial art Lee practiced, he responded, When people ask me that question, I usually say that my father created the art of Jeet Kune Do and I have been trained in that. However, that's a little too simple to say because Jeet Kune Do was my father's very personal expression of the martial arts, so I always feel a little bit silly saying I practice Jeet Kune Do, although I certainly have been trained in it. It would be more accurate to say that I practice my own interpretation of Jeet Kune Do, just as everyone who practices Jeet Kune Do does. As far as his stature goes, Brandon Lee was between 5 foot 11 and 6 foot tall, and weighed 168 pounds. I'd call him lean and athletic, not nearly as muscular as Jean-Claude Van Damme, who was several inches shorter and outweighed him by roughly 15 pounds, but Brandon Lee certainly had leading man looks. As far as a casting standpoint goes, I covered this topic with the Mark Dacascos video. He's what casting agents would consider ethnically ambiguous. Like Mark Dacascos, that could have potentially worked for or against him. For a deeper discussion about that, make sure to check out the Mark Dacascos video, which was part 4 in this video series. Speaking of Mark Dacascos, Mark was the guy that 20th Century Fox was looking for as a leading man for their action films as a replacement after Brandon Lee sadly passed away. Brandon Lee had actually signed a multi-picture deal with 20th Century Fox, the studio that produced Rapid Fire, and there were even talks of turning that film into a franchise with two planned sequels. 
Prior to 1992's Rapid Fire, Brandon Lee got his start with the made-for-television Kung Fu the Movie in 1986. This movie was a follow-up to the TV show from the early to mid-70s starring David Carradine, who played half-Chinese, half-Caucasian Shaolin monk named Kwa Chang King. The choice of a non-Asian actor to play the role of Kwa Chang King at the time was controversial, and believe it or not, Bruce Lee actually came up with this idea, but was not offered the role because he was Asian. I only bring up this fact because Brandon Lee said that being cast in the film as a son of Kwa Chang King was sort of retribution. Brandon Lee would next star in Legacy of Rage. The Cantonese language film would be the only Hong Kong movie he would ever make. You may all recognize a familiar face in that film, none other than Bolo Young, who starred alongside Brandon Lee's father Bruce Lee in Enter the Dragon, and of course alongside Jean-Claude Van Damme in Bloodsport as well as Double Impact. And he does the same move here. Basically telling his minions, back off, I got this. That's a good move. <laughs> You're not checked, that's a good move! So after Legacy of Rage, Brandon Lee will come back stateside and follow up with Laser Mission, a movie about as cheesy as its title, Laser Mission. It really wasn't until 1991 where he would really begin to show his potential, starring alongside Dolph Lundgren in Showdown in Little Tokyo. This film has become a cult classic, and for good reason. It's a buddy cop movie. What I find really amusing and interesting about it is the dichotomy between the two characters. So Murata, how come you don't know a goddamn thing about your own culture? My culture? Listen, Jim, I was raised in the valley. My dad's a white guy who's a dentist. What's your excuse? I was raised in Japan. Brandon Lee would then follow this up with his first Hollywood leading man role in 1992's Rapid Fire. The marketing was pretty genius. Move over, Van Dam and Seagal. Knock yourself out. Brandon Lee has arrived. Brandon Lee is just as exciting, intense, and charismatic as his legendary father. Whatever it takes. Like father. <laughs> like son. Like dynamite. Although Brandon Lee wanted to escape his father's image and become a dramatic actor, he hoped that acting in action films would eventually lead him to other types of roles. This is actually kind of the same hopes that both Jean-Claude Van Damme and Steven Seagal had as well. Here's a clip of Jean-Claude Van Damme broaching this topic while doing promotion on 1993's Nowhere to Run. It's difficult to find with good stories, and they're difficult to find, like, good concept. Yeah, because, I mean, that's kind of why it's probably good for you to stop doing karate, so you can, I mean, because... Yeah. Well, I came in this country, like I said, I came, I came uh, with karate, and now I'm, I'm moving to different types of movies, like uh, relationship, maybe back to action. I just finished a big action movie in New Orleans with uh, John Woo, mm -hmm. it was like fantastic. And so I'm going back and forth and, uh, you know, trying stuff. And here's Steven Seagal, also on the Arsenio Hall Show, doing promotion for 1991's Out for Justice. Will we ever see you on the silver screen where you don't hurt somebody? I hope so. Really? I hope so. I mean, uh, I'd love very much to find, you know, Marathon Man or Witness or something like that. Those are the wonderful projects that we're all looking for, you know? Yeah. Going back to Rapid Fire, many of the fight scenes were choreographed by Brandon Lee and you see elements of Jeet Kune Do throughout. <laughs> Though the film was overall critically panned by film critics, almost all of them described Brandon Lee to be charismatic. Kevin Thomas of the Los Angeles Times took it one step further and described the film as better than Enter the Dragon and that it was a star-making role for Brandon Lee. So how did it perform at the box office exactly? Well, it debuted at number 3 its opening weekend and ended up grossing over $14 million domestically, which was on par with Jeff Speakman's Hollywood leading man debut, The Perfect Weapon, in 1991. By comparison, in 1992, Jean-Claude Van Damme had Universal Soldier, which grossed $36 million stateside, and Steven Seagal had Under Siege that same year, which rose to staggering $83 million domestically. Now, say what you want about Steven Seagal, which several of you already have in my Steven Seagal video, and I'll admit, some of those burns are pretty good, but you gotta admit, love him or hate him, Under Siege was pretty badass when it came out. I also cook. So around this whole time, Brandon Lee was actually offered a role to play his father, Bruce Lee, in the biopic Dragon the Bruce Lee Story, a role he turned down as he thought it'd be awkward to play his father and too strange to approach the romance between his parents. 
Instead, Brandon Lee's next movie ended up being The Crow, a film that really appealed to Brandon because it offered more drama than action. An interesting side note, the movie's executives originally wanted to make The Crow a musical starring Michael Jackson. It was only after Brandon Lee and director Alex Porras came on board that the movie took a more serious tone. Sadly, The Crow would be Brandon Lee's final film, as he would be accidentally killed during the film's production. Brandon's death was the result of the most unfortunate and unlikely freakish chain of events than that could ever be imagined. In a way, I'm glad that Bruce was not here to see this happen to Brandon, because it would have hurt him so badly as it has all of us. With very few scenes left to film and having the blessings of Lee's family, The Crow is completed by rewriting the script using early CGI technology and stunt doubles to fill in Brandon's role. In 1994, The Crow opened at number one in the US and ended up grossing over $50 million. A star was born and a star was sadly taken away. Brandon Lee died at the young age of 28, 19 years after his father, Bruce Lee, passed away. His father's early death may have left him with a messed up perception of his own mortality. It seems Brandon Lee knew he was going to die young. While promoting the film Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, its star, Brad Pitt, told the interviewer with Esquire about a night he hung out partying with Brandon Lee. Brad Pitt says about Brandon Lee, He drove a hearse and lived in Echo Park. We went out one night and everyone else had peeled off and we ended up back at his place and it was like 6 in the morning. A real, you know, drunken stony night. And he proceeded that night to tell me how he thought he was going to die young like his dad and I just chalked it up to, you know, stony 6 a.m. talk. Then he got the crow the next year. Brandon Lee was engaged at the time to Eliza Hutton. I love you. Say that again. I love you. And the two planned a wed in Ensenada, Mexico on April 17, 1993, a week after Brandon Lee was to complete filming on The Crow. Instead, he was fatally shot on March 31st while filming a scene from The Crow in a freak accident and then buried alongside his father at the Lakeview Cemetery in Seattle, Washington, three days later on April 3rd, 1993, in a plot that Linda Lee Caldwell, Bruce Lee's widow, had originally reserved for herself. I remember I was in middle school when this happened and I seen the news in the morning, it was April 1st, it was April Fool's Day, so part of me was hoping it was some sort of sick joke, uh, sadly that was not the case. Now, at the time, I've never actually seen a Brandon Lee movie, but I felt some sort of connection to him because, as far as I knew, um, he was really the only famous person that had a similar background ethnicity-wise, uh, mixed Asian and mixed Caucasian. So let's get down to the real issue. Sure. You want to have children someday. Wow. But what will they be? They won't be white, and they won't be oriental. They'll be some kind of half-breed, and they won't be accepted by either side. They'll be American. Then it's American. I'm American. So at the time in school when they were collecting their census data, you had to check one box for your race as if everybody was just one thing, and I always felt weird about that. Um, why would I want to categorize myself as one thing? Why would I want to disavow one of my parents' ethnicity? So I ended up marking two boxes, and I'm sure the machine counting those probably malfunctioned or something. But nowadays it's different. Nowadays you can mark multiple boxes, which makes a lot more sense, especially in this country. In an interview just prior to his death, Brandon Lee quoted a passage from Paul Bell's book, The Sheltering Sky, a passage he had chosen for his wedding invitations. A passage that instead has been inscribed on this tombstone. Because we do not know when we will die, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well. And yet everything happens only a certain number of times, and a very small number, really. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood? An afternoon that is so deeply a part of your being that you can't even conceive of your life without it. Perhaps four or five times more? Perhaps not even that. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps 20, and yet it all seems limitless. Now, at the beginning of the video, I tell you to stick around until the end, and if you're still here, I'm glad you did. With the things going on in the world, the shutdown, the social unrest, this is May of 2020, by the way, but even if you're watching this months or years after this date, the point I wanna make is still very relevant. It's really a good time for us to reflect on it all to reflect on the bigger picture. Why are we here? Is this all just random? Is it pointless? 
People have been trying to answer this question for millennia through philosophy and religion. It's important to find some sort of purpose in life. In fact, I really like what Dr. Miles Monroe has to say. Whether you're religious or not, I think it's really important. You can interchange the universe with God, for example, if you're not religious. Why am I here? Why was I conceived? Why was I born? You were not created just to make a living. Until you discover that purpose for which you was created, you will never be fulfilled. Never. You'll be frustrated, disillusioned, tired, disgruntled, not knowing why you're waking up on Monday mornings. So we go to work every morning, stuck in traffic, get mad, go to the same job we hate, do the same work we hate to do, go back home to a house we can't sleep in, watch the news every night that depresses us, play our ball games, and then wake up the next morning, go through it again, and do it till we're 65, and then they fire us and give us a rocking chair and call it retirement. This is not life. What happened to your eye? I hit it. Why? Needed to. And after you pay the mortgage off, you're too old to enjoy the house. What a frustration. What is your true ability? What is your destiny? What is your sense of destination? What is your address for the future? What are you born to accomplish? How do you know when you're finished? The average person doesn't. So they just retire and rot. Senality and paralysis sets in. They have no destination for their lives. They live just to retire. This is frustration. This is you were not born just to retire. You were not born just to keep a budget going and to keep a mortgage payment. You're more important than paying light bills until you die. Now look at this scene from Rocky Balboa. What happened? I'm celebrating, Rock. Why? I retired. Retired? <laughs> yeah. So when they start giving retiring people meat instead of watches, Paulie. I don't need a watch. I got a watch! Can you give me a watch? How sad is that? Sloan wrote this movie. Sylvester Sloan gets it. Sloan has not become it. Imagine a character like Polly. Imagine your parents who may already be retired. Imagine your friends. Picture your own life. Will you end up like Polly? Have you found your purpose? Because we do not know when we will die, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well. That well is getting emptier every day.